Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Today's guest is Chris Ostich, co-founder of Listener. Listener is one of those great companies coming in that is working with the music industry, but also other industries as well. So we're talking about what the differences are in working with music and innovation and what other changes he sees coming that could be really intriguing for music that may not exist yet. Chris attended the University of Cincinnati, where he studied communication, PR, and jazz performance. And our conversation was over Skype from their offices in New York City. You'll hear some fun noise in the background. Now, you are from a company that a lot of our listeners may not have heard about. Can you share a little bit about what you guys do? Certainly. I, I, would, I would expect that no one has heard of us. <laughs> um, and that's sort of the magic in the company. Uh, we are um, Listener is the name of the company. So Listener is a four-year-old startup that was uh, founded in 2012 out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Listener is a new communication protocol, not that unlike Bluetooth. So that's something everybody probably is familiar with. Uh, Bluetooth is you know, a way to connect devices by using hardware and uh, a technology called Bluetooth Low Energy. Listener does something very similar. However, we simply use sound around us to make those connections. Today, we do lots of work in sports, live events, music, uh, retail environments, and broadcast. So in, in finding you guys, I originally, I think, ran into you guys at South by Southwest in 2015, possible. And I ran into you guys in the context of folks who were trying to figure out how in the world to be figuring out where people were in large music venues and what people were doing by triangulating high-pitched audio. How are people using your technology? Is, is that a good way to start thinking about it? Or how do people think about what your communication protocol can do for, let's say, a live music experience? Sure, I think that's the, an end result of of using our uh, using our stuff. But um, you know, when when most music events or festivals or concerts or promoters come to us, it's typically about doing something to enhance the fan experience. So, how do we reach our attendees and the, and, and our fans in, in entirely new ways? We work with people like. Um, Budweiser and Made in America, so a big music festival in Philadelphia. It's a, in partnership with Rock Nation, Jay-Z's management company. And then in this, in this venue, you know, it's in Philadelphia. It's an outdoor space, five stages, 110,000 people show up over, a, over the Labor Day weekend. So massive, massive venue. And what, what they do with us is that they take our technology, they embed it, in the, the audio system, so basically uh, you can take the listener technology, download our SDK, build our SDK into an existing app. So Made in America has a festival app, and we're integrated into that app itself. Then all you have to do is play our, they're called smart tones. You play this inaudible sonic tone through the existing speaker infrastructure, and you can send a proximity-based notification so where somebody is standing in the venue or how they're traveling you can actually send them content that's specific to what they're doing where they're standing uh, where they're not as an example so if i said i wanted to see bass nectar in my profile if i was on the wrong side of the venue i would get a notification that says hey you know bass nectar is coming up on the freedom stage in 10 minutes you better get on the move we did things like approaching a concession stand you got discounts on Budweiser products. When attendees were leaving the festival, we, were, we sent ride reminders and promotional offers from Uber. And then as a result of all of that, we're able to tell Budweiser and Rock Nation and the Made in America folks, you know, how many devices were activated, how often, where did people congregate, you know, who had the biggest crowds, where was the, where was the content the most engaging. That's, that's a reason that many live events and festivals continue to come to listener for for our solution 
How do people find out about this? How do music companies, live event companies discover you guys? And then how did you get connected with your first music festival? How did you sort of walk into this space? In in many cases, more and more festivals, concerts, you know, anybody in the music space is looking to reach, you know, uh, reach their fans. They, they want to talk to the people that are attending. And historically, there's not been a lot of ways to do that. You know, people buy tickets, they show up, they leave. How do you, how do you take advantage of having this captive audience that's already sort of self-selected into being excited about your, you know, your organization, your band, your, your DJ group? Today, when a, a festival like Bonnaroo or Coachella or even a South by Southwest or, you know, so on and so forth, when, when they start thinking about what does our fan experience look like, they typically look for, uh, you know, solution providers in the mobile space that build festival apps or, you know, apps for musicians. There, there are lots of providers in the market. Um, Alumpa is, is one of our partners and a, and a great friend of the firm. So they, they are really a big player in the, uh, in the festival app space. So it's a platform for festivals. How we walked into this, uh, you know, <laughs> probably a different story altogether. When we, when my co-founder and I started the company, we we have this mutual affinity for hip hop music, and uh, we were trying to figure out ways to create kind of a second screen experience while, you know, listening to my favorite artists. So, what are the what are the stories beneath the music that we could sort of highlight for people that that, that enjoyed it a certain artist? So we, we started off in the early be- beginnings of the business building this technology that artists could build into their, into their app or into their music. And then as their songs were being played, if you had the listener app on your phone, it would, it would trigger this you know, exclusive content to show you maybe what Beyonce was doing in the studio when she wrote that song or a video of Kanye West like recording the beat for, for a given song. What we realized was that we we did get some traction there. That actually opened the door uh, at Rock Nation, one of our partners and great friend of the firm. And they said, "Let's how do we do this across our artist apps?" And you know, kudos to them for actually going to see. It was much easier to have Shakira say, "Hey, download my app with this cool listener stuff in it," <laughs> rather than it was for us to say, "Hey, you guys should download this app that'll help you get cool Shakira stuff." You know, the power of the influencer was. Uh, was an incredible driver of um, of our our business. So that's that's how we got started around the uh, the music environment. It sounds like you became a little bit like the Intel inside that you have really great adventurous partners you're working with that are bringing the listener solution into their tool set, and that combination then goes out for festivals to work with. You're exactly right. That is exactly what we are. We are like. Um, and, and Intel inside for, you know, audio uh, beacons. Well, how do you explain then, because there are iBeacons and other things that are using the low-powered Bluetooth as a solution. How do you explain the difference between those solutions and what you guys bring to the table? Sure. We're just so much better. <laughs> uh, um, okay. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, but I'm kidding. I'm, I say that in jest a little, but um, we actually partner with lots of the the physical beacon providers, but a couple of things that are relevant to the discussion um, and it's, it's conversations we have all the time with with um, with partners with customers is that you know in the beacon environment a you have hardware right you have an investment in physical goods you have to buy the little boxes you have to install them all over the place uh, I'm gonna walk and talk because it's I got a table full that just sat down behind me, and I know the audio is important in this conversation. But, and, you're, and so you're also sitting in your very lively office there in Cincinnati, where you guys are based, right? Uh, I'm actually in New York City ah, at the moment. Okay. It's in New York, um, we are uh, headquartered in Cincinnati. You're absolutely right. I know, you know, not the music capital of the world, but um, <laughs> but we, we're trying to make it one. Um, so I'm in New York now. Uh, we work. We have an office in New York, an office in Cincinnati, and another one in San Francisco. Ah, great. Okay. Anyway, um, so back to the uh, physical beacon. Uh, and let's, actually, let's take a second because some people may not know what a physical beacon is, or they they know it exists but have no idea what it is. So a physical beacon essentially is a small 
physical item that somebody places in a venue, location, store, whatever, that uses low-power Bluetooth to essentially connect with or ping applications on people's cell phones? That's correct. It's a, um, a, a small piece of hardware that transmits a signal. The, the signal um, is, is generated or, or pushed through Bluetooth technology, BLE. On the other end, as a consumer, I need an app. I need something downloaded on my phone, open and running. That's a major point of differentiation. So the app, you actually have to walk into a store, as an example. Take out your phone. Make sure Bluetooth is on. Open the app. Walk by a beacon, and then that beacon can send you content. It is a way to push typically a, a, a notification or a message uh, through, uh, th- through the, the, the technology itself. Mm-hmm. So in, in most cases, what people use them for are, are things like in, in shopping, like in retail, it's a big, uh, there's a lot of beacon penetration in the environment where you're trying to send someone a deal or you want to reach them with you know, exclusive content only available if they have the app on their phone, mm-hmm. um, a promotional offer. Um, as it relates to music, think about the the complexity of having to install beacons for a three day festival. Right, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or at least from our perspective, when you know you wouldn't install hardware that you're going to have to tear out, you know, three days later. And that's where that's where a listener has a real advantage, is that we use just existing speaker systems to be able to do the same thing. Now, can you also so you're you're essentially though triangulating based on multiple tones being delivered in a space. Correct. So you can, uh, or you can triangulate through, um, like a, if, if you walk through a venue that has lots and lots of speakers, the, whoever our partner is, whether that's a store or a music festival, can create zones based on their speaker infrastructure. So if I know in a, in a Kroger where, where all the speakers are, I can, I can tell the, our system what to do in different locations of the venue. And that can be updated or changed whenever you wanted to. So, you know, if you if you decide to move the men's store to the women's section or the shoes back to the cologne, like the, you can simply do the update in in our portal in a, in a fraction of the time normally possible. So, Chris, what's your role at the company, and how has that changed over time? Oh boy! Um, so I'm a co-founder. Started with my one of my best my best friend in the world, Rodney Williams. My buddy, at, he worked at P&G, he was in my wedding. Like, uh, Rodney was a, a rocket ship at Proctor. You know, he's, uh, he was 28 years old or 27 at the time I met him, and, or actually maybe younger than, maybe 25. I think he was an intern or something when I met him. But Rodney went from intern to P&G superstar to assistant brand manager to running social to then, you know, first digital patent holder at Procter & Gamble. Really a a star in the organization. And I, I just saw this, this young guy that had a lot of like entrepreneurial traits and, and I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur. It's my third startup. So, I, you know, I've always sort of joked that I have a, another mission in life, which is to kind of help people quit their uh, quote unquote real job and, and start their own thing. And so that's, that's what I helped Rodden do. So co-founded the company with him, helped him raise money. Uh, so in the beginning it was, it was sort of the strategic things to, to help the company get off the ground and then marketing for uh, uh, until just very recently. So all of the brand awareness and lead gen activities for the business were under my purview. And then just a, just a few weeks ago, actually, my role has shifted a little bit to, uh, to be more sort of uh, customer facing. So uh, we just raised a Series B, uh, which is a, like our third round of capital. It was led by Intel. So we raised $10 million uh, with Intel and Quartzside Ventures and RGA, a bunch of really amazing partners, including Mercury Fund. After that investment, you know, the, everybody sort of agrees that the way that this company will grow is through partners and, and uh, you know, channel distribution opportunities. So that's my new responsibility is to, is to help the, crump, the company grow through these kind of partner relationships. And, you know, since we can't have another Rodney – why not put another founder in a role that it can be out in the market, getting people excited about what we're doing? So you have two prior startups. Were either of those in, involved in the music industry? No. The, I am a musician by trade, so I, I grew up. My father's an oboist. My mom's a piano teacher. My dad is one of the world's 
most well-known oboists, a uh, really incredible life that I've lived watching him do amazing things. Uh, I studied jazz performance, uh, went to the, um, to the University of Cincinnati, studied at the conservatory there. Um, so I've music is in my blood, I guess, is all that I'm trying to say there. But my startups previously were in very, you know, different spaces from, you know, technology to help people solve the, the challenge of being new to a community to um, my next one was now is one of the uh, world's leading employee engagement platforms. So I'm kind of all over the place. Well, maybe you can provide some great perspective to one of the core questions we're trying to deal with with this podcast series is how is music different, unique, strange as an innovation space? So what have you found maybe in dealing with the folks who are working to innovate in music that you've now worked with versus other people in other spaces or industries? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I could I could give you a couple of like talking points or maybe just a couple of things that I've felt over the years. You know, music is a hard space. It's a it, it's hard because it's huge, and uh, it's very easy to be sort of pulled in a million directions. And I think the really magical things that are going to happen in music do something very focused. They they get very they solve a very distinct pain and that those are and most good startups are that way most most good companies solve a very very core consumer insight so I, I would challenge you to think like what what is the what's the pain point that I'm trying to solve is it you know that I want to be able to uh, I, I don't know what my friends are listening to as effectively as I could, or I, I want to find breaking music better, faster. I, I mean, we, we need to, to, get, to take a scalpel to these, th- these problems rather than a sledgehammer and really get specific about our solutions that we build. At the same time that I say that it's hard, the other thing that, uh, about this space that's incredible is that when you do have a win, the platform that you are thrust upon is enormous. So the opportunities for, for growth and scale significant. So while it may be, you know, it takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources to do what Spotify did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, yep. Especially if you take a look at Spotify, a lot of their challenges dealing with separate geographies and licensing rights and yep. all of that. You've got an interesting space of dealing with a very diverse set of physical places, spaces, and organizations. How do you kind of find your way around the live performance experience in the music space versus dealing with maybe something similar in looking at retail or sports or other things? How does the physical market space in live experience in music maybe differ in how it's looking at innovation or working with you guys? Sure. It's a that's a good question and one that I'm glad we're talking about. I mean, one of the things that I love about this company is that we are and have the ability to be laser focused on building one thing, our, what we call our core product, the listener SDK. So our job is to perfect the smart tone and to make that thing as incredible as possible. And then what we do is it, it's, it's essentially a creative platform for other smart people to come in and build stuff on top of. So whether it's a live event or a retail environment, like we're kind of agnostic. We don't care. We, we love when you know, people show up and say, how does this work? What do we do? And then they hand it to their own mobile teams and they say, hey, go build something with this. This is incredible. So that, that's a really enlightening place for us to be able to live is to be really focused on the one thing that we do. So we don't do any app development anymore. We don't do the creative. Like that is all handled on, on the client side. We just focus on building the best core technology that we can. So that kind of helps us in, in sort of being fractured in our approach to the market because in reality we leave the control up to the person that decides to use us. Did that, did that answer the question or did you want yeah. me to speak no. more specifically to the, to the live event stuff. Well, is it different in live events than it is in working with other folks? Because you've got, I would think that, and I'm extrapolating a bit, in retail you've got some very conservative players, you've got some very folks who are, have big global platforms that they're trying to figure out what to do with multiple um, 
uh, malls. I mean, so you have sort of some interesting scope and scale and conservativeness. And I would think, though, that with music, you might have a different series of platforms. Are you mostly in U.S. providers now? Are you working with mostly larger organizations? I mean, you mentioned one of the uh, mid-size smaller ones. Are you finding that you're being pulled in by people who are working with very large sets of festivals or intimate locations? What are kind of the, the, the trends you're seeing that might be different from some of the other spaces you work in? Sure. You know, we, we do have to be choiceful about our about how we you know invest our time and energy. So we do you know we do we do focus heavily on on uh, audiences or or opportunities that have scale potential. So a bigger music festival um, is is exciting for us because you reach more and more people. That's really the goal of listener is to be on 500 million devices across you know lots and lots of different apps in fact our goal eventually is to be in the hardware just like bluetooth is so i i I hope that in the future you go to your menu on your iphone and you can just like you can turn off wi-fi or bluetooth that you'll have a listening button as well that's coming but we you know until that point comes we you know we do have to be choiceful about the kind of partners that we that we take on because we do work really hard to support them so that's another thing that uh, I would challenge all of this, the students thinking about building startups is that like the, the support of your platform is easily as important as the, as the product itself. The way that you support your customers could, could, uh, can save a really piece of junk. Uh, pro- <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, promise you, promise you. People will do business with people they like no matter what. And, and the way that you get people to like you is that the, get them to trust that you will work on their solution. <laughs> so if you look at our portfolio of customers, we do big music festivals. We work with huge sports teams. We work with television networks. We work with uh, big retail environments. Like a- anybody from, uh, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers to, the, to Walmart to the, the New York Jets from, uh, to, I mentioned, Made in America. Uh, the, however, you know, there are lots of, you know, we do. We're doing things in trade shows now. We, we're doing marathons, comedy festivals, and in many cases, it's it's through a partner that has distribution across a platform in that space. So, uh, as an example, like a ticketing provider could use the listener technology to to check people in without showing a ticket. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not it's not pigeonholed to just doing things around music or uh, or the experience itself. It could be like, how do we help? you know, make this process more seamless. So been, been fortunate enough to, to get some traction with, uh, with, with the big entities in the world. And, uh, and I, and obviously I think that will continue in the future. So you, you commented though, early on that to find something that's a need, that's a pain point, what pain points do you see that are in related spaces that are intriguing may not be directions that listeners going but pain points that you see that might be the next innovation space great as it relates to music specifically could be or things that are related because there's a lot of things as you've noted that music has in common with other communities and other ecosystems sure and i'm sort of i have a sort of personal commitment and vision to see some of this but um, I'd love, I'd love a bunch of bright young minds to be thinking about these things as well. But like, you know, you think about our, the history of music in our culture and, and how, how much a part in almost any major city that you go to in the United States, you know, what, what, what does art play in that, in that culture? What, what is music or the opera or the ballet or the symphony? What, what do those things, what, what do those entities play in the current culture? And how are we making sure that these important, critical pieces of our history remain as part of our culture and don't disappear with time. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for innovation in, uh, call it art tech. So more, more innovation that has the ability to, to impact the art world through technology Mm-hmm. I think is a huge place. So uh, just as an example, uh, I, I was meeting with a cluster of uh, arts organizations from Cincinnati recently, and this very famous museum w- was telling us, you know, here's what I know about 
people that come to this museum, they have a guidebook, like a wedding. Like the, you, you, you could sign out when you leave and leave your feedback for your, that you've had with your experience. And I'm, I'm like, what? And they're, what are you talking? This is, that's what we know about our patrons and our attendees. Like how else could we help them think about how to understand who their visitors are and to use that data to reach new people? That is, you know, they, they're, we're not thinking that way in enough places yet. So I think audience, you know, engagement, I think it, engagement of, of a younger population. How do, we, how do we connect new people with music and art in new ways? You know, what, what do we know about, you know, people's consumption habits? I, I think analytics is another huge space that, that gets, you know, largely ignored. If you think about a, a city the size of Cincinnati, we, we have hundreds of thousands of people that they go to concerts, they go to the ballet, they go to see a Broadway musical, but there's nothing that I can tell you about. None of these things are connected. None of them talk to each other. Uh, so I think there's, there's big opportunity there. The big idea for listener is sort of wrapped around this concept of the Internet of Sound. What What's interesting about, I think, where we're going is that when you think about sound as a new creative platform, meaning like you have this new way to reach all these people in, in, a, in a really engaging and meaningful way, it opens up the opportunity to do lots of other things. I mean, the in the in the Internet of Things space, more you know, more and more of the devices that are coming to market today, whether you're, I'm talking about like your refrigerator, the dishwasher, a, a, a thermostat. Did you think five years ago that your thermostat would be connected to the internet and you'd be controlling it from your mobile phone? No way. Your thermostat? It's like the most archaic piece of technology in the world. But here we are. We, we, we have like your oven has an internet connection. Your light bulbs are have the ability to be connected to the internet. However, one of the things that you know I'm fascinated by is that our internet infrastructure, our and Bluetooth as an example, these these sort of uh, systems were never designed to support the kind of use. And there's you know our, our the router you have in your home was not built to support 35 or 40 connected devices. It just wasn't. That's <laughs> especially if they're all pinging the thing at the same time. That's why you see Google just rolled out its new router called the OnHub, which points internet connectivity to the, to the specific device that's trying to access it. So that opens up a new opportunity for sound. Like, so you know, why, why would we continue to pile on internet-connected devices that have cost associated with them when we could just use sound to be this connective medium that touches all these devices? That, that's, a, that's an interesting play. I think that's part of the reason Intel made the investment in us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that, that should you know, put us squarely on that path. So I'm super interested in, in sort of seeing where that goes. Well, Chris, um, you've given us a lot of really interesting things to think about. Any last thoughts before we wrap up today? I think everybody should spend the first 10 years of their, of their lives or careers you know, trying to build something. It'll, it'll teach you things that you, that you will never learn in a job a quote-unquote job. I, I say all the time that, that the best teacher I've ever had is the job itself. And that it's because this job sort of requires you to think about every aspect of your business. And I, I would challenge any of, any of uh, the, the listeners out there to think, like, how do we continue to use technology to impact the art and um, you know, music categories in our lives? I, I think that there's a, a huge opportunity, and I just, I really hope that some smart people are, are working on stuff. And very candidly, I did not know about the uh, Center for Music Innovation. That I was so thrilled to hear about this. So, ever need a substitute or a, a person to come clean the whiteboards, you know where to find me. Excellent. Now, we're fairly new, so a lot of people are just finding out about us. So, we're glad to be adding people to the family. So, glad we make this connection. Thanks a lot for joining us today. You got it. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. 
Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again.